Welcome to the Real People, Real Stories podcast, brought to you by the Pasiello Group, bringing you the interesting and diverse stories of individuals working to make the world a more inclusive place. Hey, welcome to the IAP, the Interactive Accessibility Podcast, brought to you by the Pasiello Group and its affiliate, Interactive Accessibility. I am your host, Mark Miller, thanking you for keeping it accessible. Do us a favor. If you're enjoying the IAP, share it. Tell someone about it. Hey, even link to it from your accessible website. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, we have uh, uh, several people. Um, I have my wonderful co-host Todd, uh, producer Marissa, and our really exciting guest today, um, Morton. And I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. You ready? Bundur. How did I do with yeah. that? Close. That's, yeah, that's I got it. it. <laughs> All right, I yeah, got it. you got it. Um, and uh, who who I learned earlier doesn't mind if you call him Bond because who would who wouldn't mind, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, Morton's a, a, a really exciting guest for me, and I've got to admit this up front. Morton, you are the um, group senior art director at Lego. Is that do I have your title right? Or is it? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the many senior art directors at the Lego agency in Denmark, Billund, the headquarters of Lego, the Lego group. So I have to tell you up front that we are a huge Lego family. I have um, a, a, a bag of Legos. My mom made me this. Um, it's a, it's imagine like a circular piece of cloth with um, a, a, uh, like a string that that goes around the circumference of it. So uh, you, when you can gather up the string and pick up all your Legos. And I used to bring those back and forth to my cousin's house when I was a kid. I saved my Lego collection and passed it on to my oldest son who has added to it in an unbelievable way. He is 22 years old and to this day still gets a Lego at Christmas um, <laughs> as a tradition. So we're, Actually, we're fans. Kids are like, What's that? Uh, you Actually, say? Mark's wife and kids are actual Legos. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. yeah. When I say Lego family, I mean literally. <laughs> I'd like you to meet, uh, this is my son right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have my Legos yeah. over here, my favorite Legos that I have on display in my office, which I will show you guys. Um, so from that perspective, it's really, uh, uh, in all seriousness, we, we do love Lego over here. It's got to be an incredible job. Um, but uh, the reason you're here to talk to us is because you recently, um, recently, uh, uh, being a relative term there, term there um, lost sight and had um, a struggle with that. So I'm real, real curious to see how somebody who's in a job that we would all assume is, is so visually oriented um, makes that kind of adjustment. And um, we, we here at the Pasiello group, group uh, work with uh, individuals who are blind every day and they never cease to amaze us um, and inspire us. So not no pressure, but that's what we're hoping for <laughs> from, from you today. Um, so tell us a little bit, give us a little bit of a, a, a background, um, you know, just in terms of, of what your job was like, um, what happened to you, and then, um, you know, I'd love to dig into kind of how, how things change and how you coped with it. So. Um, if you can just start off giving, giving us your background a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've been working for the Lego Group for 11 years now. So um, uh, I've been working mainly uh, with uh, coming up with the stories and the concepts for uh, some of the awesome play themes that our Lego designers and builders come up with. So we, uh, we are an agency that develops all the stories and the whole content around a, a model. Mm. So figuring out how the packaging should look like and uh, the TV commercials and the, the mini movies. And, and for many years, I was uh, the senior art director for the Lego City um, mm -hmm. theme. So I came up with, uh, together with, with my co-workers, uh, came, up with, came up with the stories and the storyboards for the TV commercials. The, um, and also the the two minute animated mini movies that um, that um, sort of tell the story about the heroes of Lego City and uh, features the, the the awesome great models and 
So that was um, that was for for many years my my job at the Lego Group, and and next to that, I was living a, a somewhat secret life with a visual imp impairment with a disease called retinitis pigmentosa, which is a tunnel vision. Uh, I can test it here. It's not going to work that well because I have a background, but it's it's almost like watching the world through a a tube mm -hmm. so imagine wow. imagine um, watching the screen you can only see a little round circle of it and everything else is sort of uh, hidden behind a veil of the flickering bright light that's that's the way my retinitis pigmentosa is uh, manifesting mm. and um, I, I was diagnosed with that disease in 2002 and uh, back then it was really a minor problem because you know I almost didn't detect it it was when I was uh, invited to play a match of badminton after 10 years of uh, break and uh, I, uh, I I experienced that the ball was you know disappearing all the time and mm. and um, I was diagnosed then and uh, basically decided that you know let's just put it away let's put it in the closet and pretend it's not there and then continue mm living life as it's you know if nothing happened and i i did that then for 14 years and in 16 i finally collapsed <laughs> under the enormous pressure of being uh, so dependent on my my eyes to do my job and then my body simply said you know you are uh, you are driving us into uh, the abyss so you have to stop and then uh, my body just simply snapped and said no more so I suffered from stress and depression, and that was sort of the reboot of uh, of my life, basically. Wow, that's that's an incredible story, and you know, listening to your the way that you describe your job, and first of all, you know, as as a as a Lego fan, it's really interesting to stop and think about the fact that you guys are constructing stories around, um, you know, the 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 Lego. The different Lego, I don't know what you call them, themes or whatever that we all yeah. enjoy. That's really interesting. Yeah. In in how in in how visual that sounds, right? When you talk about storyboards and you talk about commercials, so it's it's so understandable that, you know, it, it's almost as if this is listening to you talk. This is how it strikes me. It's almost as if. The flat, the fact that you're you're slowly kind of go, going blind through this 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 tunnel vision, right? It's like literally like kind of the world's closing in. Yeah, is yeah. secondary to the mental effects of that happening. You know that that the the blindness is one thing, but the the impact it's having on you mentally because of well because you're a human being to begin with, right? And that would affect anybody. It, it would be difficult on anybody, but also because of you know your life is set up in this visual world and um it i can really understand so what i'm what i'm curious about and, you know we think of legos and it's it's all happiness right but this is your job and this is and this is real and i'm sure that you love your job i mean is the first bit of your uh difficulty and depression i'll say did that really come from the fact that you thought that this job that you were enjoying might not be a possibility for you anymore. Was that was that kind of the paramount fear that you had? Yeah, I think, and I think a lot of the problems that I experienced were very much mental. And uh, mm -hmm. I think I I had sort of um, created this uh, image, or you could say, identity that was so dependent on me being the senior art director at the Lego group, you know, this uh, driver, the father, the, you know, the, the, the guy who had everything in control, he had the dream, dream job. And mm -hmm. I, um, I was so desperately trying to cling on to that and keep mm -hmm. holding on to that. So I, I never on that journey stopped and tried to accept that I was slowly losing my eyesight. I was just trying to cope with it uh, all the time and not really facing it. So, so I think that the, the fear and the worrying was really uh, present in, in my life. Because if I didn't, if, if I wasn't this guy, you know, the, the senior art director, who would I be, who would I be and who would I, would I become? So stopping and looking at myself and being realistic about the situation uh, was a bit more difficult 
um, it, it, it was more frightening than living this, you know, uh, exhausting life that I was living. Uh, so you can say that, yes, it's a, it's a mental thing. And that's also primarily what the book is about. It's not that much about being visually impaired or, or losing eyesight. It's about how to discover where you are in life and then uh, changing your perspective on the problems that you have. I think that's uh, that's a very universal message because uh, mm -hmm. I, I realized that it was really not the losing my eyesight that was my problem. It was how I was dealing with that. Mm -hmm. So um, so the book became my journey or my my diary through this process of reinventing myself and and teaching myself to see life in a different from a different perspective than I was doing until uh, sixteen. And well, we should, we should mention, just, just one second, we should just mention the book you're talking about is Sentence to Blindness, Now What? And you released that on September 4th, is that right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. here it is. Um, I, I released it in Denmark uh, on September 5th last year, so in 19. And then I spent uh, a year uh, translating the book together with uh, Jeanette uh, uh, Kungerskog, who is an Irish translator. And uh, we uh, we sort of spent uh, half a year translating the book, um, mostly her, and I was you mm -hmm. know improving <laughs> and stuff like that. You and then, uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, and and then um, at, and then we released the book in the the fourth of September on uh, mm -hmm. on Amazon. It's it's out there now and will be out also as an audio book, uh, which I narrated uh, myself. So it will be also available on on audio. Marissa, you had a question. That's really exciting news about the book and the audio book. I'm really impressed that you managed to actually write a book. Um, it just, it seems like just a, a very intimidating act. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is, did you, when you were going blind or at any point before you came to accept your new reality, did you know anyone who was actually visually impaired or blind and who was living a life that seemed to be somewhat normal or similar to yours? Because what I found since working for the Paseola group, um, it's amazing how normal a life people with visual um, disabilities or who are entirely blind can live because of all the assistive technology that's out there. And I think that, you know, maybe if you had known some people with visual disabilities and how they're living, it may have made the process easier for you because prior to being a TPG, I mean, I can't, I had no idea that all this technology is available and I would be terrified if I knew that I was going blind because much like you, I'm sure, you know, if you don't know what's available, you picture yourself like, am I gonna need help 24 seven? Like, how am I going to actually live an independent life? And it's just, it's, it must have been terrifying. Yeah, and I didn't know anyone. I was, uh, I think it was extremely lonely, actually, those years, because, uh, yeah. you know, I have a beautiful, uh, lovely wife that I love, and I have two wonderful children and a, and a, and a su supporting family, but I was the only one with, with this condition, and no right. one in, in my surroundings could could sort of imagine how it would be and how it was to sort of, you know, walk around with a vision of only of four degrees and and uh, so it, it was extremely lonely and it was uh, only until yeah 16 I, I when I was the, the story is quite crazy because I uh, it was my wife who noticed that you know I, I was suffering from from stress and depression had been on sick leave for a year uh, not 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 a, uh, a, not a whole year but you know back and forth I was yeah. sort of getting back to the work and then poof, I, I hit the barrier again and I went off and and uh, we couldn't figure out why and uh, then she said uh, one day just you know coincidentally we had been on a vacation in in uh, on in um, in Crete uh, mm -hmm. Greece and uh, she said you know she, she noticed that I've been very clumsy on that um, on that holiday and she said you know how is it with your vision because I I never really went to the ophthalmologist because every time I went there for the first couple of years, they said, yeah, you lost a little more of your sight and yeah, we can't do anything about it. So let's see you next year. And I said, why go there even? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so we went to the ophthalmologist, ophthalmologist and he, and he um, examined me and he looked at me and said, Oh my God, do you know that you are legally blind? And I said, 
no, I, I, I didn't have a clue. And he yeah. said, you, you, are, you are legally blind and your next step is, is totally blind. And, oh. and I was like, okay. And then we sort of figured, could there be a connection between the stress and depression and the, the you know, visual impairment? And uh, I didn't have a clue. It's, a, it's such a surprise, which today I think I can't understand why I didn't, you know, make that connection that mm-hmm. being limited all day long by a vision. I had to do, you know, uh, everything that I did, I had to do like with 400% of effort compared mm-hmm. to my colleagues, yeah. that it wouldn't be a problem at the, at one point. But, but again, uh, that's amazing thing about the human mind. It, you know, it, it, it kind of copes and it tries to find ways to stay in the path that it's sort of used to be in yeah. and just the idea of changing path and changing yeah. lane is so fr- frightening and uh, but um, that was that was when I kind of okay I had to stop driving I was driving until you know that point and the way I did that was that I simply scanned everything with my eyes all the time my eyes was just flicker chugga, 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 doing like that so I had a sort of an image in my head around and uh, then, of course, we said, no, <laughs> that's, that was the end of my driving career. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was also a huge uh, blow, I, I would say, just from one day to the other, not being able to just go where you want to go and be yeah. dependent on uh, public transportation. And I live a little outside of the, you know, on the countryside, and there are really poor uh, uh, public transportation uh, here. So it, it, that was... That was a problem, and I still I think that's one of the the losses that I'm you know that feel have impacted me the most. Not being able just to do what I want right now, just to go out. I I have an idea. I want oh I need something from the from the market, and I you know I can't go there. I still had to call someone. I have to be so so that was a difficult thing. I think. Yeah. What 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 makes you? What's go ahead, Todd. Well, what I really love about what you said, and, and man, kudos, first of all, to you for, for how you've taken this on. Um, your three words that you said, changing the perspective, is huge because your situation didn't change, right? You're not going to get your sight back. In fact, it's going to get worse, um, which would think that your perspective would get worse, right? But, but it didn't. Mm. And, and I know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm an arm amputee, um, but I've toured the world as a keyboard player. But it's because of that attitude and, and the way you presented it is so, it's just so good. And um, I, I truly believe there are people with way more disabilities than you have that have no disabilities, right? Because their perspective is, is bad. They have everything going for them. They don't really have a lot of challenges, but yet you'll accomplish more than them with, with less. And, and so I just, man, I just love your take on this. Yeah. You know, Todd, it's interesting that you bring that up because I think that your story as an arm amputee, which we won't dive all the way into that today, yeah, but it's, it's out there. If people want to want to see it, you can um, YouTube Todd Waits. And, and I think it was a shark attack. So and the, <laughs> it was not a shark Spoiler attack. alert. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what Todd tells people because it's yeah. cool. Isn't it? <laughs> but um, the uh, so I, but your story's out there, and um, it, just in in what I know of you and being around you, it's very is very similar to what I'm what what you're saying right now, um, Morton. In, in that uh, there was an initial period of 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 depression of of why me of you know, and then um, somewhere along the way a revelation of this is the situation I'm in and I'm gonna have to deal uh, with it, and I think that. A lot. What you're saying, Todd, is that 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 crucible that you end up in and that you you come out of forges a different human being too. You know, just the fact that you've been through a challenge like that in in both your situations, it's it's not a joke. It's not like oh, you know, I went and did the tough mutter. <laughs> you know, it's 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 a it's a big deal. It's you know one of the biggest deals I think that could happen to somebody in their life, and to come out the other end of it, and and manage it, it's, it creates a, a stronger human being for, for sure, you know, and um, it's impressive for, for both of you guys. Um, one thing, uh, Morton, I'm really curious about is that, you know, you're you're, you're going through this with your family, you're 
you're starting to come to these realizations, right? You know, you're, you're starting to come out of what sounds like to me to be an initial real denial phase. And you're faced with the reality. And like we mentioned before, um, the biggest fear you probably have is, is your work. And, and Marissa brought up a good point. Like, did you know anybody who was blind, which you didn't because there's that support and understanding that's not present, at least at that moment, what, what was it like when you brought this to work and what kind of reaction and support or lack thereof did your colleagues give you when they probably, you know, when they first had the same realization that you were trying to cope with that maybe this was a threat to your career? Yeah, I think now, first of all, I was really lucky to, to uh, work for uh, uh, a company like the Lego group because, you know, I think I would probably have had some problems sticking to or keeping my job uh, with the, you know, this transformation time that I needed to have to adjust. And uh, they were just so supportive and um, I'm really, really grateful for that. But, um, it, you know, it, it's it's really um, part of, you know, that, that journey. I think it, it's it, the subtitle of the book is called um, A Journey from hopelessness street to possibility road. And I think what um, the book is is showing and telling is how I, until 16, kind of, you know, was in this denial phase. And that's pretty much the part part one of the book. And then the, the, the second part of the book is trying to figure out how do you um, reprogram yourself to see possibilities mm -hmm. rather than limitations. That That's... Mm -hmm. That's what I talk about when I give lectures, and because uh, what I realized was that that is a choice. You know, every we have so many choices in our life that we don't think we have. And what I did was that I gave myself four challenges to to uh, prove to myself that I actually have a choice every time I label something as bad, every time I point at something and says that's a shitty this and the shitty rain and you know the shitty bus is too late i i realized all of a sudden and that was through a lot of uh, meditation and mindfulness practice that mm -hmm. that every time i label something that's a choice i make right there in the moment but if i'm not there in the moment because i'm thinking of something about you know that's going to happen tomorrow if i'm in the past of something that happened to me once and, I, and I'm not there right now to make that decision. I will probably do what the autopilot has been programmed to do. And what I programmed my autopilot to do in, you know, basically my whole life, but especially the last 16 years was to always anticipate problems. So I had this sort of bias program in myself that I would always see something as problems. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I gave myself four challenges and the fourth challenge was actually to share this whole journey uh, to all my Lego colleagues. And uh, what I said to myself in four months, after completing these four uh, missions or challenges, I'm going to share how I decided to see possibilities instead of limitation, even though that I'm going to be blind. And I, I phrased that so it was no doubt in my mind that it would happen because I was t telling myself that in the present tense, Mm -hmm. And I, I did, I shared the story. I, I, it, it was uh, really something that kept me strictly to all the things that I learned in, in uh, part two of the book, uh, which I write about in part two of, of the book, but basically a lot about um, how you change your habits, how you reprogram the subconscious mind, learning about what is stress? Why do you get stressed? It's a, it, a lot of it is because you have a thought about something and then you don't notice it. And then you start to send signals from the brain to your body and it, mm -hmm. it creates this circle. And you know, all of a sudden you sort of in this uh, thinking circle cycle. And so, so it was, it was really much about reprogramming repro myself. And the response was, was really uh, overwhelming because people, a lot of people didn't know. And, and it was a relief actually, because when I was walking in the, in the office building, I, I had learned that I've, very often just ignored people and people thought that I was like a, this arrogant idiot, you know, didn't mm. say hi to them, but I, I wasn't, I, I couldn't mm. see them. Yeah, yeah. So when I shared that, 
a lot of people came up and said, okay, now it makes sense. So all the times I was wondering why, you know, I was doing like this in the canteen and you just, you know, totally ignored me. He couldn't see me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. that was a huge relief. So, so all the worries that I had about sharing the story kind of, you know, it was just such a relief to just get it out of the, you know, out of the system, sharing it. And that's also what I feel from writing the book. And today, I you know it's so easy for me just to do things because I don't have that fear anymore. I, I, I'm not, every time there's something I'm f afraid of or get worried about, I know that's just because it's unfamiliar. And I, that's a great opportunity to learn something new. And if it goes totally wrong, I can say, awesome, I learned something. And <laughs> next time I'll do it in a different way. And uh, that's just uh, such a, you know, such great way to live instead of living in, in fear all the time. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, that's amazing. And I think that, uh, you know, you bring up mindfulness, which is, I'm, I'm glad that you did, right? Because that's, I think, a lesson that you had to learn that other people could benefit from and learn um, who haven't already, you know, obviously, um, just in their regular everyday life. And it's that, um, you know, like you said, sort of recognizing what your executive center is doing, <laughs> you know, and getting in, getting control over that. I think that that's an amazing, amazing lesson. And I think mindfulness is, you know, I hear that resurface quite a bit in stories like yours. And I think it's, uh, um, in, in, in just, you know, for people in everyday life to manage stress and stuff like that. Um, so talk to me, you know, we We've established, I think, that we all love Lego, right? I have my, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. I'm holding up the, uh, the Beatles Yellow Submarine. Yeah. And I've got yeah. the, um, the Fab Four right here with it. These are, these are gifts from my kids. Um, <laughs> oh, he's going to leave and get, <laughs> we're going to have a Lego show and tell. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll also show you. This is one of my favorites too. That uh, oh, that's awesome! I bottle. love it. Lego. Uh, sorry. <laughs> the the oh, the Mustang. Yeah, yeah, Mustang. yeah. Oh, wow. Oh that's man, really now I'm jealous. Forget my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, and we have so things, much Lego. These uh, we things, don't know where to put it. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what we have. We have. I literally walked down in my basement, and it's filled with. Uh, because when you build something like the Yellow Submarine or the Mustang, you you keep it. You know, it doesn't go into the pile. <laughs> and no. uh, you you get you, you're you don't count right because you have your own piles of Legos at work. I'm sure that you can just grab. I've always been yeah. jealous. Of those, those Let me interject. I have a question here. Now, Martin, you've probably not done this, but who admits that they've tried to take shortcuts and cheap? cheap uh imitations and tried those and they never snapped oh together. no they yeah you know, got, it's got to be it's got to be lego yeah and, and by the way just i'm gonna go off on a tangent here i was actually heading somewhere with all that but <laughs> one of the things that and i wonder morton if you if you thought about this right because i thought about this um since i've been working it uh in this industry lego is a completely accessible toy you can give Lego to somebody who's blind and they can understand all the individual components they can construct with it. There is no limitation. It's a hundred percent. I mean, it even in a sense has, has, has a, uh, a braille like uh, aspect to it in that you can uh, even tell, you know, if you were communicating with somebody and you're saying, Hey, can you give me the brick? That's, I don't know how you probably have a way to communicate it, but that's four, you know, four long or whatever. You can feel that out. It's a completely accessible toy. Don't they have Braille Legos like to teach? Yeah, the, the, I was going to say. I was going to to. to I, I thought you knew that. <laughs> Is I just assumed that everyone I don't, knows I didn't, maybe well. Yeah. But but we actually uh, we just launched the Lego Braille Bricks system, yeah. and that's. Yeah, uh, cool. So what is the Braille yeah, brick? They, not? Well, that you, you you imagine it, it's sort of you know so intuitively you know it's, it you just take the the the, the um, two by four brick. And uh -huh. then you mod you modify the the bricks so it uh, corresponds with the, the braille uh, alphabet. So we created this uh, set that is going to be um, uh, it's it's um, it, it's the Lego foundation. So it's it's not something that you can buy. We're going to give that to visually impaired children all over the world. Uh -huh. um, uh, and then the, it's it's a it's a playful way to learn braille instead of so struggling with. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah exactly. So you can play, but it also have the letters and um, and uh, numbers on it, so you can play together with sighted peers. So it's a uh, it's an inclusive okay. toy where you can you know if you if you can't see you can sort of you know. Uh, utilize your superpowers to write codes that you know the side appears can't see <laughs> yeah. and uh, but it but it's just a it's just a really cool uh way to modify that the lego cool. bricks to accommodate the the braille letter uh, alphabet so mm. th so that's just out there i i haven't received my prototype or my set yet so i really wanted to show it to you but uh but yeah because so, uh, i'd love to get my hands on one of those if it's possible i'm not you know, I'm cited, so <laughs> I don't qualify. But it would, I would love to get my hands on one of those. And um, it, it's uh, uh, one, because it sounds like a great way to learn Braille, which I've tried to do. And it's, I can't even feel the Braille. It's, my brain doesn't want to want to do it. But um, uh, it's, that's fantastic. And was that inspired by your, your story within Lego for that? Or was well, it a different initiative? No, not, 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 uh, not at all. It was actually something that's been uh, brewing for many years and it was just in you know recent years that the Lego Foundation had the resources to to go mm -hmm. and produce this and uh, but I was brought in uh, quite late in the process as a as a consultant because they when I was tr starting to speak up about my uh, disability they learned about me because uh, I'm in a whole whole different department of, of the Lego group so mm -hmm. they invited me and showed me the, the the model, and they brought me to a test in uh, Birmingham last year, where I was just blown away by seeing the kids playing with the Braille bricks. It was just so so amazing. So I was brought in for uh, for a period as a, as a sort of a spokesperson to right. have some insights in in uh, being visually impaired, and uh, so that was just amazing. And um, it's gonna, I think, I think it's gonna do so much good. <laughs> and do you do you read Braille yourself now? Did you learn Braille? Well, that's I think that I think that uh, no, I the, the, in recent years I've come to believe that you know sometimes there's something more than you can see with your eyes. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of laughing internally when the Braille bricks were just put in front of me because I've been uh, avoiding mm -hmm. <laughs> confronting myself with the possibility that I once maybe have to learn Braille. So, mm. so you know, I'm a stubborn guy. So when I say no, I will pick that up the, the day it's necessary. And, and that's why I, that, that's how I do things. I, when I, when I, when I'm in a position where I need to learn something, then I start learning. That's the best mm. way I'm, I'm being motiv um, motivated. But, but here there are signs from somewhere saying, you know, maybe you should, uh, maybe yeah. you should learn Braille. Maybe we have a <laughs> playful way for you to learn it. Why? Yeah, why yeah. don't you start maybe. now? <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. Morten, I wanted to ask you, um, would you say that with your new mindset, prior to really accepting your disability, um, you said that you had a more negative mindset and your autopilot was really just kind of set to a, a negative, you know, which yeah. a lot of people have. Would you say that now you are in a better place despite your disability because of this mindset? Or is it more, you know, now you feel a little bit more centered like where you were maybe prior to 2002 when this all started happening? I was much more disabled when I could see actually really? wow. yeah i think i think uh i had you know i th i could always feel that i had you know a lot of potential to do great things and i think we all have but what i learned uh when i was you know i i it described it in the book as i had a the gift of dying before mm -hmm. i was dying mm -hmm. in 16 i was sitting in the municipal office with the uh, people around me we were talking about how my retirement plan should be and i was i was sitting there and all of a sudden i heard this very clear voice in my head saying what do you want to do with your life morton and until then i have had that voice all along but i never noticed that i had a voice that would that was whispering in my ear like no you shouldn't do that you know you get a great idea and then you had that the voice saying yeah you, you shouldn't probably do it you know it's, it's you know it's not safe and you know people yeah. will probably say you're stupid and you know yeah. all that so i once you know all of a sudden i realized you know i i literally died in there not literally of course but metaphorically i yeah. died in there because i felt that you know i lost everything i lost my 
my job. I didn't even lose it, but I felt that I lost my job because mm -hmm. I openly said, you know, I can't do it anymore. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I lost the ability to, to drive. I lost the ability to be me. And then I felt more relief than ever before. I felt like, oh, what a relief right. getting rid of all those identities. So I said, okay, if I can, you know, in one second, get rid of all those identities, I can create whatever identity I want. So I, I had this sort of distance from what mm -hmm. I call my real self to yeah. that avatar that we walk around looking at from a distance. And we are so entangled in that identity. But right. I sort of realized that I can, you know, take one step back and be the observer of, you know, that thinking mind that is, you know, doing all the thinking and the, and the thinking is just happenings. It's very, uh, it's a very it's an Eastern philosophy kind of way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, so today, when I get an idea about something, I act on it be before five seconds have passed. So I just, I get this idea. I know it's great. I go do it. And then poof, sometimes I, I even yeah. manage to write an email, put and, and press enter. And then I say, oh, that was quicker than, you know, my inner criticizing voice could say, yeah. oh, I should do it. like, just do it. And, yeah, and, yeah. and I love it. Yeah, I think that, that, is, that was also the reason why I could write a book. But, you know, you know, that's that's a heck of a job to do. And I couldn't find yeah. a publisher because they said, no, you should. Uh, well, it's too much about, you know, it, it, we can't figure out if, is this a self-help book or is it a book about a blind guy? And I said, you know, it, you know, it's my journey. It's my story. You can't, you know, you, can, mm -hmm. you can't just change it. And then all of, you know, after seven editors and say, okay, I'm going to publish it myself. You know, just get out of my way. I'll do it myself. And then I did that. And, and then I said, okay, we need to translate this book for the world. And they said, yeah. well, it's going to be difficult. Then it's going to be fun. And then I just went on, you know, having no idea about how, just deciding to do it. And then oh, doors will open uh, automatically and, and magically when you just start walking. And that's, uh, I think that most people don't start walking. They just, they just get stuck and, st and it's not said in a negative way. It's just said in a, I really want to share this with people that they can actually make up their mind to do awesome stuff the moment they stop listening to that inner critical voice that, yeah. that is speaking all the time. That's, mm. yeah, I mean, amazing stuff. It's, you know, you have that, that metaphor of, of sort of dying um, and it makes sense because as you talk, it's clear that there's the other side of that metaphor where there was a rebirth. Mm -hmm. You were able to yeah. re, re, reinvent yourself um, and it does. I mean, I mean, you, I'm sure all three of us are doing the same thing. We're sitting here wondering what what am I in my own way of right now? <laughs> you know, yeah. now that now that I've heard that, what am I in my own way of? Um, the uh, w w so we're we're getting to where we need to wrap up here soon. But what I really want to um, get into is what what it was like to reinvent yourself at work, w going from this thought of I can't do this anymore and I'm going to lose this all to, to realizing you, that didn't have to occur. And, and I would imagine that it's not just in your own head that this, that this transformation has to happen. You also have to have sort of the buy-in and the support of the people that you work with as well, right? Like they've got to be confident yeah. you can do this job. So how did that evolve so that you are now where you are today, where you're still doing your job? It, can I add a question to that? And, and hopefully this one doesn't put you on the spot, but, um, and there's no wrong answer. Do you feel that you're better at your job than you were prior? Uh, <laughs> it does put them on the spot. Good, Good question. Yeah. Good well, it, <laughs> well, it, I think I'm not, today I'm not doing the same job as I did uh, before 16. I actually transformed myself and uh, from being very much a uh, regular uh, art director doing, you know, what an art director does into now being more of a um, internal motivator, uh, speaker at the Lego group, um, working closely with uh, the HR department, uh, people in the organization, departments in the organization book me for internal uh, uh, talks. So if they have, an, have a day, like uh, an away day, and they're gonna you know, talk about how do we manage all the changes we are facing right now, 
then I'm being booked as this storyteller who comes in and tells and shares my story basically. And uh, it is transformational. Yeah. So, so that's, that's what I do a lot of at the Lego group, but then I'm also still involved in campaign development, but more as a, you know, the guy who, who, who uses his brain mm -hmm. than using his eyes. So I, I, I adjusted, but it, I, I think it's not easy to do that because when people know you for, for one skill or for something and you all of a sudden very dramatically change who you are, that's going to make people, you know, what the heck is going on? Who is this guy? And really, I thought I knew him. Now he's talking all this uh, Google uh, <laughs> sort of, you know, self-help stuff. What's going on? Like he's, he's so different then. So that I can also feel that, that, uh, that some of my colleagues are like, you know, some don't speak to me that much anymore because they know they, I'm not the same guy anymore. So, yeah. but I had this uh, idea that my kind of mission right now is to show people that they have uh, potential that they haven't discovered yet. And mm -hmm. the, the mission of the Lego group is to inspire the builders of tomorrow. So that's very close to each other. So I kind of had an idea once in a, in a meditation, I came out of it and said, now I know what to do. I have to sort of make my path and Lego's path, you know, uh, synchronized somehow. Yeah. And I've been working for, uh, working on that for a couple of years now. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's a, I, I feel often that like, you know, I'm very lonely on this journey because I'm basically inventing every step of that yeah. journey uh, yeah. as I go. But that makes you a pioneer. I mean, that's a wonderful position to be in. Maybe a lonely, right? If anybody who's pioneering and at the top, they're a little bit lonely, but uh, uh, not for long, right? <laughs> you know. So what a what an amazing story, and I really appreciate the motivational, the mindful. You know, that's that is the you know those are the golden nuggets I think that come out of your your story, and it's wonderful that you discovered them yourself. Um, but it's you know, even more wonderful that you're, you're out there sharing it with the world. Because I know personally that I've been inspired by um, a number of people with disabilities because of what they overcome and because they're as successful or more successful than I am given a, you know, given a, a challenge like that. And I think that if you are out there showing that to the world, um, that that's just a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. So, Oh, I've, I've got, we got to wrap this up soon because I have um, a book to buy and a Lego <laughs> Mustang set to buy <laughs> now that you've shown me that. Uh, um, but uh, do you guys, any, uh, Todd, Marissa, do you have any last, uh, Marissa, you've come up with two great questions this podcast. Any, anything else that you want to wrap up with? I have a comment unless Marissa has one first. Go for no, it. I just wanted to thank Martin for joining because I really, really enjoyed this podcast a lot. Me too. Yeah, yeah, Martin, I'm just I'm a good man. I, I thank you for being honest. Thank you for doing what you do and and for the passion that drives you. And um, you know, I look at you as as I made up a word that I can't imagine you'd want to steal, but you're welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> People get hit with something and they say, you know what, I, I can survive that. I'm a survivor, but you know, I think there are sur thrivers, right? You didn't Ooh. just survive. Sur thrive. Thriver. Todd, Todd, why are you that's not the in the word marketing that describes team? You. That describes you. <laughs> how parallel is your path with Morton's, right? I mean, you had the same, you had a similar challenge. You speak, you motivate, you've pursued your passions. So when he says that, I mean, it's coming from it's coming from a special place because you and Todd do share a lot of that same, that same thing. And it's been, you know how I came up with that word. So I don't mean to be a name dropper, but there's a band called sticks. It's one of my favorite bands. <laughs> <laughs> Their bass player and I are, are friends and he's gone through a, a crazy stuff in his life, a bunch of cancer, a bunch of just, just everything. And he's, I'm like, man, you're not just surviving. You're, you're like, still touring the world and, and you're still doing this and that. And I'm like, you're like a thriving something. And I just said, you're a thriver. So that's kind of how it. Sir thriver. How it now. New word, yeah. new word. 
See, so in your next book, you'll have to use, make sure the word Sir, Sir Thriver sneaks into it. How does that sound? <laughs> well, the difference in our, in our intelligence, Martin, is that you came up with a whole book full of words. I came up with one word. So, yeah. I mean, it's kind of the same. Really, it's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. One word versus a whole book. Good morning. I'd love to connect with you offline and uh, yep. chat. All right, we'll, we'll do that. that. That's only because he wants yeah. to see if you get that Lego Mustang from you. But. Yeah, exactly. Don't lie, that. <laughs> he has an ulterior hey, motive. Don't believe him, Martin. That's right. Hey, um, Martin, any, any last words from you? Anything you want to wrap up with or, or make sure that we, um, you know, we don't miss in this before we, we sign? Well, no. I think, I think uh, the last thing probably would say you can, uh, you can get the book on Amazon. Right now it's, uh, it's available there and it will be available in, on Audible and uh, iTunes and Amazon as well as, as an audiobook as soon as they get to my book. It, you know, in the COVID madness right now the you know the 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 time it takes to get it through the machinery and all that it's, uh, but it's it is done and it's written uh, it is narrated and produced and everything it just needs to be uploaded there and uh, and it will be out there as well so on amazon Great. and i think an important point too is if you, in case you've missed it through this whole podcast is that this book is not for someone who's blind necessary this is for everyone these are the lessons that you've learned that can benefit us all. So um, I, I know I'm going to be grabbing a hold of it and I hope that. Uh, yeah, I think, I think you can actually, I, I want, I, I did a poster once where I'd sort of crossed out the word blindness because, you know, can, you can say sentence to, and then you can put in your own yeah. sort of problem. And uh, I think that that's what it is. Cause you know, yeah. I, you can put in everything and it, this is about growing bigger than that problem that you think you can't surpass that you can't uh, survive and, and it's 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 i just want to show that you can actually uh, overcome everything when you decide to and uh, that's that's the essence of the book we appreciate it and and yeah. I'll definitely especially as a self-publisher i'll give you my support i've been around that publishing circle myself and i know um that's that's difficult and and you're on your own when you do it so we'll see if yeah. we can be able no. to help there as well and hey, thanks, you know, thanks for, for uh, Lego too. It's, it's a great, you know, it's brought a lot of joy to my family and it sounds like a great company, especially there he is. Yeah, I got my, I've got my, this is me, by the way, before we go, this is me. Um, so Morton, this is the, uh, uh, one of the guys in a tuxedo with uh, the head has sunglasses on, he's holding a coffee cup. Um, but my kids constructed that and said, where is it? There it is. Dad, that's you in Lego. So oh yeah. That's, that's a Lego. Huh? That's yeah. a Lego me according to my kids. And then of course I have Darth Vader, like who who oh. should yeah. Yeah, Mark, I hardly recognize you today without the tuxedo. So I know. I usually wear usually a tuxedo. In a tuxedo. Yeah. So. To to work. So you was, work from home. <laughs> he doesn't wear a tuxedo. You, you were showing the coffee mug. Uh, uh, once there was this joke going on uh, when we did the commercials and we did the uh, animated movies you know the yeah the police guy you know the chief he mm -hmm. always had a coffee mug, coffee mug. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah it, it's so, it was so stupid every time you know the most busy and most dif difficult situation that he was holding his cup you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I love my coffee joking. i can't blame the guy you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. i don't mind saving so your just, life as long as i can have I get coffee. my coffee with me. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was sort of a joke. So we had the coffee uh, mug every time that, you know, we were showing this chief yeah. officer. <laughs> well, it, one of the, the, uh, the uh, uh, characters that you guys do, I'm going to hold up the, the Beatles here. They're amazing, right? I always am amazed at how uh, you can take this kind of, you know, Lego figure that doesn't look like it should be able to change much and turn it into something recognizable. So. Yeah, but we are amazed as well because you know we we just receive the stuff. We we help and we uh, we uh, have meetings with the designers. But you know sometimes I'm just <laughs> my mind is just blown by when yeah. they construct things, and I just oh my god, this is brilliant! <laughs> like I yeah yeah. Hey, uh, when you get information on that, the um, Lego Braille too, please send that our way. We're going to post um, along with this podcast. We'll make sure that we have. Uh, links to your books. Any other links that you are important to you, uh, Morton, that you would like us to have, please send them to Marissa. She is great about making sure all that stuff gets pulled together, but um, we'd love to have information on the uh, Braille Lego as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, anything else that's that's yeah. uh, important to you. Absolutely. So I'll send you links. 
we have to wrap it up. And like I said, I got a couple purchases to make here. So I got to go. Um, hey, I just, I just want to say, Martin, I'm glad that everything is awesome in your life. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it's, it's not always awesome. I think I am. I'm always. I have I always have to be diligent and you know be mindful about what's going on. And uh, often it wants to take me to dark alleys, but I consciously have to disagree with that direction. So it's mm -hmm. it's never ending sort of exercise in staying positive. And and I you know we all have have peaks and valleys. But I was doing a play on the Lego movie, Everything is Awesome. That's right. I, I got it. <laughs> my... Good job. Good job with that one, Todd. <laughs> that, was, that was over my head. <laughs> um, I do I do know what you're I do know what you're talking about. Uh, yes. All right. Well, everything is awesome. And this is Mark Miller thanking Todd, Marissa, and Morton and reminding you all to keep it accessible. This podcast has been brought to you by the Pasiello Group, the experts in digital accessibility. Stay tuned for more Real People, Real Stories podcasts coming soon.